Hi, you're listening to WSFI Catholic Radio. The show is Cross Examination. I'm your host, Mark Curran, WSFI, 88.5 FM, 7:50 AM, WNDZ, Chicago, and Libertyville, Illinois. And our guest today is Father Lawrence Carney, the third Father. Welcome. Thanks for having me. So Father is is in town, and we're going to tell you why he's in town, what his purpose is, and his about his book, and all of that good stuff. Father, I want to uh, have you introduce yourself to the listeners, and you tell us about uh, where you're from, and, and a little bit about how uh, you became a priest. Well, my name is Father Lawrence Clarney, and I was born in Wichita, Kansas in 1975. The reason why I became a priest is when I was six years old, a priest came into my kindergarten room and he gave us a card of Our Lady of Perpetual Help. And he said, hold the card out, children. So I held the card out. And he said, move the card back and forth. And I saw real eyes from the uh, Our Lady's eyes. And I thought, wow, if a priest can do that, I want to be a priest. So that's the only vision I've ever had was when I was six years old. And you were at a Catholic uh, kindergarten father? That's right. St. Wow. Joseph, Wichita, Kansas. Okay. So take us through, the, where'd you go to high school? I went to Bishop Carroll High School in Wichita. And then college? Yeah, I went to Newman University and then the University of Kansas, and I graduated there. Then I worked for three years in the workforce, and I had been running away from the priesthood. But then I went back to that kindergarten room, and it was changed into an adoration chapel. And I got on my knees, and I remember the priest telling us about Our Lady. That's where the the Eucharist was. And I thought, well, what a coincidence. So I got on my knees, and and I said, God, I'm not going to run from you anymore. So I joined the seminary and became a priest about 16 years ago. And what diocese was that? Wichita, Kansas. And so you, are you a diocesan? Yes, I'm a priest? diocesan priest. And I noticed that you wear a hat and the, the long uh, vestments. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So I wear the cassock, and it has 33 buttons to represent the 33 years of our Lord. And then it has five buttons here on each collar sleeve to represent the five wounds of our Lord. And this is a saketa. This is... Some people call it a skull cap. And there was a pope in the uh, 17th century that required all clerics to wear it. And that's still the law, but it just not very many clerics wear it anymore. And clerics, a fancy word for deacons and priests and bishops. So why do you think that is that nobody wears it anymore? I think or a lot very of very few, I should say. Clerics just don't know about it. Yeah. And also, there's a revolution against all of our symbols of the Catholic Church. Traditions. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Where were you first assigned? I was assigned in Wichita at St. Elizabeth's for two years. And yeah. Then Kansas, Gerard, Kansas for two, and Wellington, Kansas for two. And then I asked my bishop for leave of absence. Uh, and I went and took a, a backpack in Europe and walked a Camino. And I was wearing my cassock and people came up and talked to me. What do you mean by Camino? The Camino is the pilgrimage that goes to the relics of St. James, the Apostle, up in northwestern Spain called Santiago, which is also St. James. And so thousands of people have been doing pilgrimages for almost two millennia there, and it really changes people's lives. And so why did you decide to do that? I wanted to know what God wanted me to do with my priesthood. So... I did that, and I came back and became a chaplain for some nuns. And so what was the conclusion that that came to you from that? What did God want you to do with your priesthood? He wanted me to walk around the streets of the cities, and that's what I do. And then I also come and talk about the Holy Face. Right. So we want want to get to that. What city are you in right now? Chicago. Well, what city are you assigned to? Oh, I'm in Wichita. Still in Wichita, Kansas. It's the Cubs used to have a triple A team down there. And the, I know the college was the <laughs> Wichita Shockers. They've That's gone right. a couple times fairly far into the uh the basketball tournament. Is Wichita a Catholic city? 
it sort of is. It's not as Catholic as Chicago, but it's like 20% Catholic on one side. And then the West side, it's 50% Catholic. So it's, it's gotten more Catholic. It used to be a cowboy town when it first started in the Wild West. Yeah. You mentioned about the holy face of Jesus. So you're a writer, correct? That's right. So how did you become a writer? Well, I was walking the streets of one city, and then a the newspaper did an article on me, and then that got to a publisher, and the publisher asked me to write a book. And I said, what about? And she said... And who was the publisher? Caritas Press was my first sure. publisher. And so they're they're national, a big Catholic publisher. They're small. Publisher. They're small. Okay. But, but she said, just write about the stories of the people you meet. Yeah. She asked you to write a, write a book. And did you know how to go about writing a book? Well, it was almost like preparing sermons, just have stories and just put all the sermons together. And then that made a book. <laughs> yeah. So you basically stories you collected from walking around Wichita became a book. Yeah, and other cities too. And what were the other cities? St. Joseph, Missouri, New Orleans, Baltimore, yeah. Chicago. Well, that, that's kind of interesting. What was it like walking around New Orleans? It's uh, a very yeah. Catholic city, at very, least in name. It's a very Catholic city in name, and it's in its traditions. Yeah. It's buildings. Yeah. It's like... It's like the only city in the U.S. I consider to look like a European city. Right. Well, it's not a county. It's it's a, <laughs> it's a parish, you know, for all the uh, the areas of, of Louisiana. And that's because of the Catholic uh, history of the state. <laughs> in New Orleans, they have the beautiful cathedral, St. Louis. Uh, but obviously, New Orleans is kind of, a, in some ways, a modern-day Sodom and Gomorrah. What was it like? Just, you know, I'm sure the listeners are fascinated. You're walking the streets of New Orleans. What did, what are you ta telling people? You're telling them about Jesus, or what are you doing as yeah, you're walking I, around? I pray a rosary, and then people come up and talk to me. And I get the whole spectrum from there was a 13-year-old boy who was visiting from out of state, and he just saw us. I was walking with another priest, and they came up to us and wanted to talk about what we were doing. And I told him, I was just praying a rosary. So I gave him a rosary, blessed rosary, and he took it home. And then there was a guy, he called himself a leprechaun. And we were talking and having this strange conversation. And he said, Father, excuse me, I got, I've got to go do some magic. I know you got to go do some prayers. So we had all kinds of conversations going yeah. on. Were a lot of the people uh, intoxicated? Yes. So that's Bourbon Street. typical for New Orleans. Yeah. And you got to go to Bourbon Street in that area right around it because that's really where all the people are, right? That's right. I'm trying to save people. You walk into a neighborhood and, you know, a bunch of big homes. You, somebody might come out to grab their mail, but that's about it, right? You're not right. going to actually see people. So you're walking around th those areas and um, you got scantily clad women showing their breasts and trying to get beads and you got guys drinking too much and vomiting in the streets and you got uh people dressed up in in uh in some level satanic costumes and, and outfits and what have you and I, i'm thinking that probably jesus isn't the first thing on their mind is it no it isn't okay so you know let's say you're just i'm just walking along and i've had you know three hurricanes and a couple of beers and you come up to try to talk to me about jesus how's that go well, I won't be with them, but there was, I remember on Bourbon Street, this lady came up to me. She was young. She said, Father, I want to talk to you. And so I did, and I taught her how to pray the rosary. And then there was a crowd. Mm -hmm. There was people wanting to get a rosary and, and learn how to pray it. So you've got to go into the beast sometimes. With right. The power of God is more powerful than the power of darkness. Yes, yes. Was it... A particular time of day, I mean, it gets crazier as the oh, night yeah. goes on. I wouldn't go at the night. I would only go in the afternoon. Okay, so you got more, like, people just sightseeing and right. going for the food and everything as opposed to just going out to real, really uh, engage in debauchery. That's right. Yeah. But you'd talk to them. What was the, what line would you use? You said, you uh, can no. I pray for you? Can I teach you how to pray the rosary? Or what would it be? I would just say, what's your story? And then they would tell me their life story. Wow. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah. 
that's interesting. Did you have people that like saw the the Roman collar and they get mad and they start yelling? Or no, no one ever got nobody mad. threw a beer at you or anything no. like that. Wow, it's crazy. Um, because I would have expected less from the people. Some of the people I've seen in New Orleans. I went to college down in Mobile, Alabama, so we weren't oh. far from from New Orleans. So I'm very familiar with that city. You did that in New Orleans. You did that in uh, St. Louis, did you say? St. Joseph. St. Joseph, Missouri. I'm sorry. And so is what's St. Joseph known for? Not not our, our it, St. Joseph, the was, worker and the Holy Family. But they were the, the ones that outfitted the pioneers mm -hmm. in the uh, last decade of the 1800s. And so you'd do the same thing? You'd go up and talk to people in that city? I would just pray, and then they would come and talk to me. Okay. And you mentioned Chicago. We're particularly interested in Chicago because that's part of our radio um, audience, if you will. You're listening to WSFI 88.5 FM Catholic Radio, 750 AM WNDZ uh, Catholic Radio. And uh, our guest is Father Lawrence Carney III. And if you want to call and make donations, it's 224-206-8455. Or it's WSFIRadio.org. We're really blessed to have uh, Father Carney visiting us from Wichita, Kansas. The city I'm really interested in, I think our listeners too. What was it like walking around Chicago? Where did you go? I was I was staying at St. John Kansas. Oh, beautiful, isn't it? Yes. And yeah. I saw how'd you know about St. John Kansas? Oh, they helped me learn the Latin Mass. Okay. And you dress a lot like uh, their priests would dress. Oh yeah, I wear the, I've worn a cask every day for thirteen years. Yeah, and it's a beautiful, beautiful church, isn't it, Father? Oh, it's so beautiful, and seeing six priests hearing confessions and, and yeah. lines, it's green just, light, perfect. red light, it was just, just like, perfect. oh, this is what we used it's to have. Terrific. Yeah. Do you hear confessions a lot? Not too many, because I'm a chaplain for nuns, so I hear a bunch of nuns' confessions. Yeah. So I do hear a lot. Actually. Yeah. You were staying at St. John Kansas, which is right off the expressway, close to Division Street, right? I just uh, walked downtown, straight down for the big building. Yeah, it's not that far and away. I was just praying my rosary. Yeah. And so what would happen? Me, what would happen? And I think they were just looking at me like, wow, that's uh, some, somebody walking in a black gown. And I was just praying a rosary. And it usually takes a while for people to warm up. So I only walked one or two days in Chicago. Okay. But you know, uh, Mark, when that, when I do this, I imagine it just leaves an impression on some people. Right. They're searching for God. They need a sign. What and month were you walking in? It was probably like this month, May. So it was weather was decent. Yeah, it was decent. rainy. It was nice. You'd just be walking down the street, and they'd come up and talk to you. Sometimes, and yeah. You'd be praying a rosary. Mm -hmm. And did you walk in any of the uh, neighborhoods other than the downtown? Did you just downtown for yeah. Chicago? Right. So we'd like to get you out to the west side and the south side. They need some help and some <laughs> holy prayers and everything else. Uh, actually, the north side as well. The north side's, they all, each area of Chicago has its own sin. The north side is uh, renowned for probably sexual. The south side and the west side more for violence. You know, there's a lot of sin going on in Chicago. What were your impressions of Chicago? Well, Chicago used to be the city of the saints. And that's what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. Mm -hmm. There was this father, um, Crowley, who was from Chile, and he preached about the Sacred Heart. And he said, you all had 100,000 people sign up for nocturnal adoration in the homes. And I'm going to say, Chicago, you're a sleeping giant. I'm here to tell you to wake up. There were some holy people here in Chicago. So this devotion to the Holy Face is a means to destroy the revolution that's around us right so, now. So let's talk about that, Father, the, the revolution. What, what, you say there's a revolution going on around us. What is it? Yeah, so uh, poor um, humble nun in the 1840s received revelations from Jesus Christ. And Jesus said to her, my father's greatly disappointed for two sins. Blasphemy and profanation of Sundays and holy days of obligation. And Jesus said, My father's not going to punish the race so much with the elements 
both revolutionary men. So the punishment is revolutionary men. And whenever God gives us a curse or a punishment, he, he teaches us how we can get out of it. So this devotion is a blueprint for Catholics to get on their knees. And God walks us through how we can mount a counter revolt. So who, what is a revolutionary man? Is Communists, using it, using it. Freemasons, free thinkers, uh, nihilists, just any kind of ISM. And nihilists, could you just... Yeah, they just... They don't believe in anything in the spiritual world. There's no afterlife. Nihilists. Okay. They're philosophers. Got it. And so earlier you were talking about the, the power of the sacred heart of Jesus. Would you expound upon that a little bit? Yeah, that's... Father Crowley would talk about the sacred heart of Jesus and how if the world would be consecrated to the sacred heart, then the world would escape the punishments that our Heavenly Father's given us. So, so how do you get consecrated in the sacred heart of Jesus? You make total consecration to the sacred heart with so preparation. Let, let's um, dummy it down a little bit, just in terms of what does the word consecration mean? What is it, you know, as simple as possible, just because I, I want to make sure all the listeners are, uh, are able to comprehend this. Yeah, the including myself. <laughs> the consecration of the sacred heart is yeah. doing the what is it? The nine first Fridays where you go to mass on the first Friday of the month and you do certain prayers, and that's the consecration to the sacred heart. Now the consecration of the holy face, which I'm uh, focusing on, is where we prepare ourselves in the interior life so that we can someday be prepared to see God face to face. So this devotion of the Holy Face is one of the greatest devotions that was told to Sister Mary St. Peter that heaven would ever give us. Um, just the word consecrate, what does that mean? That means to give yourself completely over to God. By doing those acts, you're, you're showing that you're... You're amenable to that. Yeah, you're you're giving of your your well being to God, your time and talents and your yes. finances. Excellent. This earlier you talked about these revolutionaries and what have you. Now we've been seeing these revolutionaries for some time in America. I would submit to you, Father, that we've been on a downward path for mm, four years. 40 years, yeah. That, that's my guess. So you, what do you think about that? Yeah. You were born in 75, is that? That's right. So you were born in when it was still, we were still going like this. And that's been shortly after you arrived, it started going the other way. Yeah. And there was no correlation between your birth. I didn't mean it that way. You know, you, we've been going in the wrong direction for a long time. I've submitted to the um, concept that it's over for America, but for a miracle. I mean, we, right. we're just past the tipping point. That's right. And that's what this devotion is about to the holy face is, and my dad talks to me about this. It seems like we need God's direct intervention in the world to change the way things are going. And so God can do that <clears throat> if we let God fight this war for us. And that's what this devotion to the holy face is all about, is teaching us how to be humble again and not to be in charge of the world, but to let God be in charge of it. Right. Does it seem like, you know, even in the political arena, that we're looking for saviors in, in place of, of Jesus? And I know a lot of people out there like Donald Trump, and I think he was a really good president, personally, you know, but by the same token, he's hardly a savior. And on the left, all these people thought that Barack Obama, they put him on this big pedestal. And to me, it was, it was a little bit um, disgusting to see that just from the perspective that really only Jesus deserves that. Yeah, Christ is our king. Yeah. So if we find ways to approach God and make him our king, then this world will be full of blessings. Right. But historically, when we look at scriptures, you know, we were always putting things up there that people and, and, and things other than God is, is being our king, right? That's right. Like so the it's, golden it's calf. Old, yeah, golden calf and, you know, the... You know the the uh, prophets and the, not the prophets, the, the kings of, of the Old Testament, and the, that they um, 
we were always looking for something other than the Lord up right. top. Yeah. So that's just a, a history repeating itself. So when we say it's over, but for a miracle, but for, as you're going to talk about the holy face, what do we mean? What do you, what, when I, I say it's over for America, what does that mean to you? What, what, what is it? It's, it's about over it. For America? Well, we know that no nations are going to last forever. And none the, ever has. None ever has. And the only institution that's going to last till the end of time is the Catholic Church, because that was instituted by a divine being. All these right. other institutions were instituted by a human. Right. So America's, I would submit that America's biggest problem is the increasing secularism. That less and less okay. people believe every single year. That's right. And that's not, that hasn't stopped. Every single year it goes down and down and down and down. That being said, is that is that what destroys the country? That's what destroys the country. But we need contemplatives. That's Those are people who get serious about prayer. And if in the Old Testament, you can tip the scales. If there's a few good people, that can change the way the politics will be for a nation. And it only takes a few. So this is a clarion call for people, I'm saying from my own heart. Yes. To, to be the best Catholics we can be is the most important thing. Not the best politicians we can be, but the best Catholics, because then we let God get engaged right. in this battle. Agreed. Just a couple words on one, just contemplative. So sometimes I always think of that word in, in the context of like a, a monk or, or somebody that, that spends all their time in prayer, whereas... We each have a different gift. A contemplative would be somebody that was more in prayer, and then there's people that would be more in the doing of things. Sure. Is that fair? We all need to be contemplatives in a way. I was just at Marytown where they have perpetual adoration. That is, the body of Christ is in a monstrance all the yes. time. Yes, we we are familiar with Marytown and Libertyville right up the road from here and as wonderful a place as there is for Catholics, and it is um, some very, very holy, wonderful priests that offer the sacraments every day there. Clarion, what does that word mean? Clarion call means clear. It's uh, I, I'm challenging everyone out there that's listening to consider God's drawing you all to be more and more fierce at praying, more and more serious about praying, to be more generous and abandoned to uh, mortification and mortification means to kill our sins and abandon means to just the will of god and the, our father i will be done and so is it possible to live a holy life without prayer no it's impossible so prayer is the most important thing that any human being can do and to be a good catholic we have to be able to have a daily regimen of prayer. If it's one rosary day, that's awesome. If that's where someone needs to start. And if more people that aren't praying engage in a life of prayer, then the scale is going to tip in, in the favor of the good guys and not evil. Right. We're moving in, into the direction now where we're going to talk about this holy faith, the face of Jesus that you brought up several times. Talked about it was and there was that in the context of the book that you came up with the title the holy face of Jesus. Well, the secret of the holy face is that this devotion was given in the 1840s to Sister Mary Saint Peter, and it just hasn't really come out into the mainstream. And that's what Jesus told sisters that this devotion is going to come out for a little bit, and then it's going to almost be gone, and then there'll be a second wave of apostles in later times that will promote it. And so we're in that time right now that we're just starting to get this devotion known to the world. Father, I don't know that much about the holy face of Jesus and because I ask all these basic questions, uh, that's probably why Angela thought maybe I'd be a good interviewer for you. <laughs> so I hope I'm not um, you know, making this too infantile. But the holy face of Jesus. So I know about the Shroud of Turin, right? Mm -hmm. And that was the uh, Jesus garments, and uh, that has a, a, his face. Is it burial? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And Veronica's veil, I know a little bit about. Which which one of those, or are, are there others that we're talking about when we talk about the holy face of Jesus? And do we really have one face? You know what I mean? Jesus 
I mean, we have, he looks like that in this here, and he looks like this over here, you know. So could you expound upon what, what do we mean by the holy face of sure. Jesus? So this devotion is principally concerned with the vow of Veronica. And that was when Jesus... Who was Veronica? Jesus was walking to Calvary, and Veronica, it's not her real name, but it mm -hmm. means true icon. And she had a veil, and she gave it to Jesus when he was carrying his cross so he could wipe his face. And Jesus left his impression on it, a miracle, to Veronica. And Veronica went to Rome, and she gave that to the first, or Pope, the fourth Pope, and then all the Popes have it now. It's not her real name. What was her real name? Her real name, we think, is Seraphim from the one of the choirs of angels. And so why did we give her the name Veronica? Because that was a traditional name that was given to her, but in private revelation, Sist, uh, Venerable uh, Catherine uh, Emmerich said that her name was Seraphim. So it's private revelation. So we can take it or leave it. It's not right. something we have to believe. Right. Why do we pick that holy face of Jesus and not another one? Because... That holy face is what Jesus wanted to be the object of this devotion. So there was an arch confraternity made. An arch confraternity is like a spiritual army. And Pope Leo XIII approved of this arch confraternity. When was Pope Leo XIII? He was in the late 1800s. Okay. So in 1885, he made this arch confraternity. And one of these, the veil in Rome was put out, and a miracle happened there. And... What was the miracle? The miracle was his face you couldn't see on the veil. And they had a, a thin piece of silk in front of it. Jesus' face you couldn't see? Couldn't see it. Mm -hmm. And that blank piece of silk took on the liniments of his face. And then there was a light that shone from it. It was mm -hmm. a miracle. And artists drew that. And they engraved it. And then they had replicas of this made on linens and touched it to the relic. Well, here's the cool story. One of these relics got to a man named Venerable Leo de Pont, who was a friend of Sister Mary St. Peter, who received these revelations. And he put it in his drawing room. And he burned a candle in there day and night. And then people came to get healed from that oil that was burning. And there were so many miracles that it came to Pope Pius IX. We see so many miracles. Give us an example sure. of some of these miracles. Adele was the first miracle. Her eyes were hurting so bad, and she went to ask for, for Venerable Little Pont to heal her, and he took oil and said some prayers, and she was healed instantly, gone. And then, So what was the connection to the veil in, in that one? Well, that veil was touched to the veil of Veronica, so it was a relic. It was touched to it. And so Venerable had 6,000 certified miracles. That means... These miracles were certified by physicians who said this miracle can't be explained by science. And there's not very many saints that perform over 5,000 miracles. Right. I mean, you see they're waiting around for the second one for all these people right. that are stuck in the beatification stage. 6,000 miracles. Why you don't you ever wonder why we don't hear about that in the secular world? That's That's the thing. This devotion has such potential. I used to be investments before I became a seminarian. And my job was to look at little companies that were going to be rising stars. And that's what this devotion is. Mm -hmm. It's a little devotion that's a rising star. Why would God give 6,000 miracles to this devotion unless he meant for us to see how important it is? Right. Yeah. Do you think that that's the way Jesus looked or is that just... Uh symbol of the way he looked or it doesn't matter yeah it's the way he looked what would you see is a white man that's what it shows yeah and he's got a beard and you know the long hair so it's probably the most common image that we've seen of jesus or close to it's not uh you know startling in the in the sense that it's different than all the other uh drawings and what have you so here's some historians like try to quarrel with whether or not he would have had darker skin or what have you What's your thoughts on all that? Uh, that stuff's not too important to me. Yeah, it could have been, but um, that wouldn't necessarily... The skin color really isn't something that you're going to know from a um, 
the, his the image being mm -hmm. put on a veil exactly. So that, like you said, that's less important. Father, you said that tomorrow, or when we had the uh, Save Our Country Day, where you know that's going to happen, and this show is probably going to air after that. But nonetheless, it's May thirteenth, and it's in Cook Park in Libertyville, Illinois, and Save Our Country: The Antidote Given by Our Lord Against Communism, Atheism, and Men Rebelling Against God. The most beautiful devotion under the sun. Our Lord to Sister Marie St. Pierre, arise, O Lord, let your enemies be scattered. Let those who hate you flee before your holy face. Will you expound upon that? Oh, yes. So this might be one of the most beautiful devotions under the sun. So why would our Lord say that? Um, there's lots of devotions that are very important, like the rosary. What do you say? Why, why would our Lord? Who said that? Our Lord said that. When did he say to that? Sister Mary St. Peter in the 1840s. And that was in... In, uh, in Tour, Tour, France. So when the Blessed Mother appears, it's called an apparition, right? That's right. And when our Lord appears, it's called... Uh, what? Yeah, an apparition Still or an apparition. apparition. So you, you, there's a lot less of those where our Lord has appeared to somebody than the Blessed Mother. Right. So it's, And you said that this is not... Um, one that's been the has the Holy See said that this is to be accepted, or is what's the status there? Yes, because since Pope Leo XIII made it an arch confraternity, he approved of it, and that's what. So it has the same status as Lords or um, Fatima, or yes. yes, it does. Yeah. But it's so little known. Yeah, exactly. That's why yeah. my job is to promote this. I've never world. heard of this until just now. Yeah. Okay, this is crazy that we don't know about this. And that is, it has been, you know, I mean, who doesn't know about Lourdes or Fatima that's been studying the church for a few years? Everybody knows. Everybody, Everybody knows about up in Champion, Wisconsin. Yeah, but we don't know about this at all. This is an underdog. And it has and it has the same level of acceptance by the by the it has an arch confraternity. Yeah. That's the highest level you can have besides yeah. being a religious community. Yeah. So essentially the church is saying, yes, this yeah. happened. And that's what Sister Mary St. Pierre's job was. Jesus yeah. told her, basically, you need to keep working at this so that it will be approved canonically. And that's where the church says, by law, this is acceptable. Yeah. This is. So it's not canonically approved. Is it? Or is it is it, because it is. it's an arch confraternity. She, she had a lot of trouble when she gave all these devotions to the archbishop and she was in an interview and it didn't go so well and then she passed away but venerable leo de pont was a friend of hers and he kept promoting it for 40 years and then finally another archbishop a few one down the line came and took these revelations out of the archives because they were sealed under secrecy and took them out and gave the lot of data to them again and gave them to some theologians, the Benedictines of Salem, and the Benedictines said, this is great. This is dogmatically correct. And so they presented it to Rome, and then Pope Leo XIII said, this needs to be an arch confraternity. And it was a miracle there, they say, in the court of Rome, that something like this should have taken at least five years, but it yeah. happened in an instant. Yes. That's wow. a secret. So what's the chaplet of the Holy Face? In, in, I'm familiar with, obviously, the chaplet of... Uh, Divine mercy. Sure. So the chapel of the Holy Face is it's six beads, and there's five of those six beads. And there's three more, so that's 33. Where on those beads. So it's a different than a rosary right. bead. Instead of it's a different 50, it's, it's, it's a necklace that's completely different than a rosary. It is. Yeah. Right. So wow! So instead of fifty, so that's why the divine mercy is so easy to do because it's the same as the rosary, right. the same number of prayers. Right. But this one, what is it? What does it look like? This this uh, the, the do you have the necklace? Yeah, I have one in here. Great. This was this revealed as well to get this necklace? Yes, the Sister Mary Saint Pierre. Wow, this is beautiful. Jeez, this is beautiful. Wow, just so listeners can see the beautiful cross. Um, and then right here is the image of, uh, is that the uh, uh, Immaculate Heart of Mary? The Pieta. Right. Yeah. That's 
Mary and Jesus. Mary and Jesus. I'm sorry. And then there's yeah. the veil of Veronica. Oh, and there's the veil of Veronica. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. So I've seen that image of the veil of Veronica countless times. I just never really mm-hmm. was cognizant enough to know that that's what I was looking at. Thank you, Father. You're Thank welcome. you so much. Was that revealed that that or who created that? That yeah, um, Sister Mary. Do I use the right term when I say necklace? Well, a chaplet would be yeah. the correct term. Because a rosary, I call a rosary. You're right. But this is not a rosary. It's something different. Yeah, we so use I said the term chaplet, but you use chaplet. Okay. Little, little rosaries. Okay. So, yeah, Jesus said, say this prayer. Arise, O Lord, and let the enemies be scattered. Let those who hate thee flee before thy face. So we do that six times in honor of the sense of touch. And then we do it six more times in honor of the sense of hearing and then et cetera for the other senses of smell, touch, and and sight. And then we do three more in honor of the three years of public life. Oh, there's six or seven senses. There's five senses. All five. Five senses. So you added one. Oh, whoops. I meant to say five. (laughs) I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm not. uh, Yeah, you can tell I'm not on top of my game either. You're, you're, I didn't mean that to you about you, Father. You're terrific. And so the main point of this, it's like I call it a minor exorcism. Yes. And because this prayer from Psalm 67 is what Pope Leo included in his prayer called the minor exorcism, which exorcists use for people and places. So, what's the, what are the prayers that you say? Just the, you Just mentioned that. the one. And then the glory be. Glory be to the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. The beginning is now and ever shall be world without yeah. end. And what else? And So you say this six times and you say a glory be? Yes. And then what else? And Anything then you else? say uh, my Jesus in, mercy. And then you include one of the a, five senses. Is, is there an opening prayer? It's just, oh God, come to my assistance. Oh Lord, make haste to help. Where did that come from? That comes from the Psalms. Okay. And then yeah. what's the concluding prayer? The concluding prayer is seven glory bees in honor of the seven dollars, the seven sorrows of Our Lady, and then seven more glories. Bees what are the, the seven sorrows of Our Lady? Those were the seven swords that pierced her heart when she was suffering underneath the cross. Because yes. it was a psychological suffering for her. Because okay. she didn't have the pain that Our Lord did. Yes. And then the seven last words, Right. we do seven more glory bees in honor of those, and those are the last words that Jesus said. It's really, why do they say seven last words when it's really like more like seven last sentences? Well, it's, into your, Lord, into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Now, that's eight in English, but in Latin, yeah. it's seven words. Okay. Those are the seven last words, and I think Bishop, Bishop Fulton Sheen taught, has a book on the seven last words. Okay. So there's a great devotion to that. And so okay. we say seven glory bees or is it yeah, in honor of those seven last words. Okay. And then that's it. We say the sign of the cross, and that would be the chaplet. And so what is promised uh if you were to do that? That's a great question. The chaplet is designed for the triumph of the Catholic Church, and we need that so badly. The church is so important, and she is just going into an eclipse right now. But if the church was strong, we'd be fighting this revolution and winning, but we're not. And the revolution has infiltrated our church and tried to destroy us from within. Mm-hmm. And that's why we we need this devotion so bad. Is because, like we said at the beginning, we need God's direct intervention at this time. Most people are just... Thinking along these lines, I it's what I'm thinking. Right. And so this is a blueprint of how to let God get involved. Is there a personal promise, like an indulgence or something of that nature? Yeah, there's there's nine promises to those who become devoted to this. And one of them is very beautiful. It was given to St. Gertrude. But and where do the promises come from? Who, who decided that? That was the arch who decided that. So they had the authority... By Pope Leo XIII to mm-hmm. issue these, and so my favorite one is. So we believe that's divine revelation as well. 
Yeah, it's private revelation. Right. And my favorite one is those who are devoted to the holy face, their faces will shine in heaven brighter than others in eternity. I want that. <laughs> right. Wow. So 120 is the May crowning. What does that mean, May crowning? Well, that's when we have a statue of Our Lady and somebody puts a crown. May is the month of Mary, right? That's right. The month of the rosary. Mm -hmm. So Okay. So, yeah. They put a statue on her head as described in the book of Revelations. or Yeah, she'll have a crown with 12 stars. Right. Tell us a little bit more about the book that you wrote. You, you, in the, the title is... Uh, the secret of the holy face, the devotion um, to save, destined to save society. And it's uh, by uh, Father uh, Lawrence Carney the Third. You just elaborate a little bit on the saints. By the way, you're listening to WSFI Catholic Radio, eighty-eight point five FM, seven fifty AM, WNDZ, and our guest is Father Lawrence Carney the Third. He is the author of The Secret of the Holy Face, The Devotion Destined to Save Society. We were talking about your book. Father. Yeah. So I decided to call it The Secret because this devotion is a secret and it needs to get out. And then I subtitle it The Devotion Destined to Save Society because Pope Blessed Pius IX said reparation is destined to save society. So what is reparation? Reparation means to rep repair the relationship between our human family and God. So that's what this devotion is about, is making reparation. And I think that our Pope Pius IX was a prophet, that reparation is going to save our society. So that's what this devotion is about, is making reparation so that God can fight this war and take out all the evil leaders that are above us. They're getting above us. Yeah. So the way we hear the word reparations used nowadays is people that are um, blacks, I guess, are, are claiming that they deserve reparations because 200 years ago, or maybe not that long ago, but whatever period, somebody they were related to was in slavery. Um, that's not what we're talking about, right? Now, this is the most important definition of reparation. It's the relationship between our human family and God, because we can't be like Cain, you know, that didn't really pay attention to his brother. All of the humans in this world we're responsible for. And we've got to be like brothers and sisters, because the way that we are as a human family in front of God determines whether he's going to give us a blessing or a curse. And so if there's just a few good people, a few good saints making reparation, that can change the relationship. And, you know, it only takes a few good priests, like saints, like only 10 saints to change the whole world. Right. So this devotion, I think, in my opinion, can raise up some young men and women to become saints. Right. We're just starting it. Yeah. Restarting it, basically. Yeah. It's a good point that you make when you think of... Uh, the Cristeros in Mexico were, I think it was four saints that came out of that war. Mm -hmm. And, you know, essentially, like you said, they saved the nation as far as they saved the Catholic Church being able to be in that country and, and everything else. So, um, yeah, it's, it's it's really, there's a lot of saints, but, but there were four, I suppose, that were recognized, four that elevated themselves to the status that the church recognized them. So, Father, this is great. Where, where are you headed after this? Are you, are you doing this in different uh, places? Yeah, I'm going to South Dakota and Minnesota next month. And then I'm going to go to Boston after that. So, Boston, you, they just had that satanic... Uh, yeah. What was it exactly? They had some type of a, you know, double worshiping conference? That's what I've heard. I haven't paid a lot of attention yeah. to it. Yeah. We had, I was a longtime sheriff of Lake County. We used to always have our um, sheriff conferences around the second week in June. And it always coincided with the Pride Parade, whatever city we went to. <laughs> okay, my kids and we were Pride Parade going on in the hotel and, you know, and uh, the streets and all that. And I just remember 
I remember Boston really had. I, I actually was in Boston a couple of times, but I remember Boston was really big into the whole the rainbow. Mm. That was a favorite uh, <laughs> of that city. So yeah, you're gonna have your work cut out, Father. We wish you so well with with regards to all you're doing. Where have you been before this? Oh, I've been right before this. I was in North Carolina. I gave a ten day circuit mission. So I went to different parishes and talked about you, this devotion. What was the impact of that? Oh, I think it's just planting the seeds. Yeah. It's, so you don't see it right away necessarily. You're going to, the seeds are planted and, and hopefully they take root and down the road. Well, you know, God always picks the least, most <laughs> appropriate instrument for his works. And that's what he's done. When I was little, I was afraid of public speaking. And that's what he's got me doing. I can't believe he wants me to preach on, on something like like this so mm -hmm. that's how it confounds the wise of the world yeah yeah <laughs> how did you overcome that fear just uh pray grow, prayer grow just get, christ get praying and praying and yeah. praying isn't there a lot to be said for that uh that that i made you know die to self so that i may grow in christ it's like you know i i wasn't i, I was always like in the theater or what have you but it wasn't I'd get nervous at times, but then as I realize how irrelevant I am, and it's really, <laughs> my only purpose is really to, to serve God and to glorify him, then when the focus is not on you, you know, then you're able to use those talents that God gave you in a way that otherwise, if you were inward, you wouldn't be able to. Isn't that That's true? That's right. That's what I tell my friends. Yeah. Yeah, I was just in North Carolina and did all this 10 times. 10, yeah. And then I say, and guess what? I'm doing this to promote God, you know, to Jesus yeah, Christ. Yeah, yeah, face. yeah, yeah. Like, okay, then that's. That's the end game. Right. Absolutely. No, that, that's awesome. So uh, what else would you like to leave our listeners with out there as you uh, embark on, the, on this uh, tomorrow? What, you know, what's what's our hope? What, what is it? What is the uh, the saving society? What does it look like in the, the America that's been saved? I think it's people really getting serious about a prayer life because then God will give them wisdom. And a wise person is known, whenever there's a crisis going on, whenever his words bring peace. And there's so many people out there that God's calling to a deeper life of prayer. And no one can take that away from you. Once you get it, it's golden. And that will determine whether or not you go to heaven or hell. That will determine whether or not you get a high place or a low place in heaven. And the saints say, we need to, Aim for the highest. So, and we can do that by the power of God. And he comes to us when we really want to become true prayer warriors. And so I encourage people to really look into the devotion to the holy face. Because God loves a soul to fight for him. And whenever there's adversity, then that's a time for us to show what our true metal is. Are we really going to stand up for God or are we going to be cowards? And prayer makes us to become spiritually strong. Amen. Father, would you be uh, ever so kind as to close us in a, a prayer for uh, the listeners out there? You know, also for, for your uh, ambition of saving our society. Sure. I'll give you my blessing. Benedictio de omnipotentis, patri that fili spiritus antecedent super te et vos et mani et semper. Amen. In the name of the Father and Son of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you so much. And what was that just uh, translated? That was, may the blessing of Almighty God descend upon you and remain with you forever, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Thank you so much, Father. And once again, you've been listening to Father Lawrence Carney III on WSFI Catholic Radio, 88.5 FM, 7.50 AM. Until next time, we say goodbye. <laughs>